Well, welcome to the, to the end of 2018. As we reflect over our attention is drawn perhaps to the best and the worst of all that transpired in 2018. Maybe you quickly look back and think, what were the best and the worst movies? Or the best and the worst songs? Or perhaps you, you look through the internet and you see the, the top animal videos or the funniest videos. You're drawn to those memorable moments in sports or you're marked by the people who have died and will no longer be with us. As we review 2018, that's just a nice reminder to us of all the things that have transpired in a short synopsis in that one year. We tried to encapsulate everything that transpired by looking at maybe a top ten, the most dramatic pictures that captured the events. The events that transpired in the political realm, if we want to be depressed. Or perhaps on the stock market. Or in family matters. Whatever they are, they soon draw our attention to the fact that we are looking forward to a new year. What is 2019 going to bring us? We don't know. Because those movies haven't been released yet. Those songs haven't been sung yet. Those people are still here with us. That time hasn't been lived yet. Perhaps some of us are, just, are thinking in 2019, one of my resolutions is I want to read the Bible more. I actually want to read through from Genesis to the book of Revelation. I want to be a Christian who can say, I have read the Bible at least once in my lifetime. I come across many Christians who have never read through the entire book. Because when they look at it, they go, it's so thick, I'll never be able to make it. And when they look at the page numbers, they'll say, over a thousand? Are you kidding me? A thousand pages? That's too much. That's more than Lord of the Rings. Or some other book that they pick up. That's more than, well, I won't, I won't pick, on, pick on some of the other books. But maybe you want to memorize more. Say, so this is going to be the year that I'm going to memorize God's Word. I'm going to figure out a way to memorize. I'm not going to look at the little kids and say, kids can memorize, that's great. But how can I, as an older person, memorize? That's just impossible. There's no way I'm going to be able to do it. Or I'm going to study God's Word. Regardless of whatever your, your goal is when it comes to God's Word, you have taken the first step because you have come to church. You put yourself in the winning position because you've made an effort to say, all right, I'm going to at least show up to church on the last day of the year as a good start for the beginning of the new year in 2019. Because I'm going to put myself in a position where I'm underneath the Word of God so I hear God's Word on a regular basis so that I might be motivated to follow after God. So this morning, I want to give you something that will help you in that area. That will help you. Not necessarily memorization or reading your Bible. Those things you have to be intentional. You have to decide that those are things that you want to do. And you're going to go do them. And with God's help, you will succeed. But I want to give you something that's going to help you in your everyday life. That when you come and you leave church today and you go to work tomorrow or the next day, that you'll be able to take this truth with you and say, this is something that I can use because it's affecting me in my everyday life. What is this? Well, I'm really making a way to the computer, but while I'm there, I'm going to show you these signs on the wall. These are one another commands, and you see them all over our church. And each one you will usually say something different on them. They're, we're to love one another. We're to confess sins to one another. We're to forgive admonish, care for, greet, sympathize with, show hospitality, pray for. Up over on the other one, bear, bear burdens for one another, con be considerate of one another, comfort one another. These are all true things. These are all things we're supposed to do for one another. These aren't suggestions. These are things that the body of Christ is supposed to do for one another that we in this church are supposed to do for one another. So as we're looking at one another's, one of the, the first commands we want to look at is the principle of partiality. Showing favoritism. 
I ask you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Because in verse 21, Paul is charging Timothy. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing without partiality. Now, you and I, when we think and we hear the word, sorry, when we hear the word prejudice, I don't know, what comes to my mind is racism. That happens, comes right up. But you may not think of yourself as a racist. I don't think of myself as a racist. I grew up in Maine. We didn't have any color people up in Maine. When we think of racism, we thought of the North and the South, the Civil War. That's what we fought. And that was over. And our country was supposed to move on. But now I live here in California. And I moved to the Bay Area. And I was struck with the multiculturalism. And I was struck with people are different from different cultures. And racism wasn't just a black and white thing. Racism can be anything. It can be any color, any different group of people. But partiality just isn't about race. As you look through the Bible, you might think, is there racism in the Bible? Of course there is. But there's something even more insidious than racism. And Paul brings this out to Timothy. It's favoritism. He says, now, I'm charging you. Make sure that you, do, you are not prejudiced and you do not show partiality. You do not show favoritism. And why is he stating this in chapter 5? Now, I've got to show you the context because that's so important while he's stating this. Paul is, has told Timothy, who he's writing to in the city of Ephesus, to establish elders, people to run the church. So if we pick this up in verse 17... We see some of the things that are taking place here in which Paul is telling Timothy, here, Timothy, I want you to be aware of some things to establish for people who are running the church. Be aware of this. Here's some principles of favoritism. When you see somebody that's doing a good job, recognize a good job. That's okay in verse 17. Let elders who lead well, your Bible might say rule well, that's the idea it means to lead well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. So we have some leaders who are doing other things and some who focus their attention upon the word and upon teaching. Verse 18 says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out its grain, and the laborer is worthy of its wages. These are two items that are brought out in which Paul is probably quoting Christ. And if you're not coming from an agricultural society, you're going, what in the world is he talking about muzzling the ox while treading the grain? One of the nice ways to get animals to work is to put a, a, a feed sack underneath while they're eating so they can eat and walk at the same time and do their job. You just put it right under their head and they'll chew the grain and keep walking. Kind of works that way with junior high kids too. You feed them and they'll keep walking. Parents of your kids in church, when we, we had little kids in church, I would sit there and think, I was new in the pastorate, I wanted my kids to sit there and be perfect. Don't make a sound. Don't do nothing. Don't eat in church. And my wife would be sitting here pulling out bags and feeding them like, like a pigeon. And I said, we can't feed them in church, you're not supposed to have food in church, and it's like sacrilegious. Where is it in the Bible? It's not in the Bible, but... As, they're, as she's feeding them, they're quiet. I said, that's wisdom. That is so smart. I'm, and she said, did you bring any snacks for them? I said, no, I didn't bring any snacks for them. I said, it's only like an hour and a half long. Why do we need? She pull up. She's got snacks in her purse. And she's feeding them. And they're quiet. I said, this is great. That's the wisdom of a mother. So that's that idea. We see the same thing play out in other parts of life. 
Paul's telling Timothy, recognize a good job when it's taking place. There's something that's, that should be taking place. But don't do it showing partiality. Don't do it because you like somebody and say you're going to reward somebody because you like them. You may not like the person, but when they do a good job, they need to be rewarded. They need to be recognized. It's not about, hey, I like that person because he's a good teacher. There's people who are good teachers and you don't like them. You ever have a teacher that you don't really like? But boy, they did a good job. I have. The second thing in there, verse 19 says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Refuse bad word. If someone comes up to you, Timothy, and says, I got to tell you about elder so-and-so. He's doing this. Wait a minute. Timothy, do not receive the negativity. Do not receive bad words because someone comes up there and they want to gossip or they want to tell you about an elder's doing this or an elder's doing that. Make sure that you do not listen to any report unless there's two or three witnesses. And what Timothy is being told by Paul, hey, if there's something really bad going on, Timothy, it should be something that's legal. Meaning you've got two witnesses which establishes a truth. I remind you, how many people in the court of law against Jesus confirmed his sin? I'm going to make you think a little bit. How many witnesses did they try to get to prove that Jesus was a sinner? How many did they get to show that they tried to get two of them to verify and they couldn't even get two? It was a kangaroo court. Until Jesus opened his mouth, what further need do we have of witnesses? You're guilty on your own account because of your own claim. But Christ only pro- proclaimed the truth. So they denied the truth and they crucified him. So throughout a Jewish court, and even Roman's court, you have to have witnesses. Just like our court, you have to have witnesses. So don't receive a bad word. Next, rebuke sinful, uh, sinful actions. Uh, rebuke them. Verse 20 says, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. But if there are elders who are sinning, Timothy, make sure that you call them out on what they're doing, what's wrong. Do not put it under the carpet. Pastors who are sinning, elders who are sinning, who are doing wrong, they need to be called out in front of everybody and said, that's wrong. Who's responsible to do that? I hate to tell you, church, you are responsible for that. You are responsible to hold your pastor accountable. Is it easy? No. It's hard. If you see me doing something that is wrong, you're accountable to call me to it. It won't be easy. It won't be fun. It'll be hard. Then recruit a good, a good person. Lastly, it says, I charge you before God. You got that in verse 21. It says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share another person's sins. Keep yourself pure. The laying on hands was a, den- was a way of identifying a person in ministry and pulling someone out and seeing and recognizing a person's call for ministry. And Paul's telling Timothy, hey, don't just jump on quickly and find someone that says, hey, I feel I'm called to ministry. I'm called to serve God. Don't just rush out and say, all right, I agree with you, and we're going to lay hands on you. He says, don't be quick on that. Let it be played out. Let it be shown. The person who says, I feel called to go to the mission field. Great. Are they serving in the church? Let them see that first. Are they following and serving Christ in some capacity here before they're going to go out to the field? There's a couple areas there in which we have to be careful we're not showing favoritism. And Timothy's job is to be balanced and to be blind in this area. Just like you and I are to be called in the same thing. We're not to show favoritism towards people 
in the job they're doing or to listen to reports that we're hearing unless they're verified with more than one person. And when we see sin, we're out to call it out for what it is. And point out, this is wrong, this is bad, we don't do this. And we're not just to join up with whoever says, hey, this is what I want to do, and join to it. The principle that we're looking at, don't do anything with favoritism. Now, we have to beware of playing favorites. This can happen in any sphere, in any, in any life. Now, I want to take your, draw your attention because favoritism is a flaw of a character. And I want to draw your attention back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 27. So you can see this played out in real life. Genesis chapter 27 is a passage that you're familiar with. It's people that you're familiar with. The passage that I'm going to read is going to be a little bit long. But you probably weren't thinking too much about favoritism and family favorites when you were reading this story. There's two people involved here, really. They're twins. They're the first twins that you've probably paid attention to in the Bible. Jacob and Esau. It says, now it came to pass, Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim, so he could not see. He's about 137 years old, by the way. His boys in this passage that we're going to talk about, they're about 40 years of age. He's 60, he's 60 when the kids are born, when they're twins. I'm telling you this to give you an idea of they're not teenagers when they're having kids. They've got some life experience. And he called Esau, his older son, and he said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. And he said to him, Behold, I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapon, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me your savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, and my soul may be blessed before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make me savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to, my, to what I command you. Go to the flock and bring for me two choice kids of the goats, and I will make the savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, and he may eat it, that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall be seen as a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse upon myself, and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go and, let th and, and, and get them for me. And when he went out and he got them and he brought them to his mother and his mother made the savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her, son, of her elder son Esau, which were with her in her house, and she put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goat on his hands, and on the smooth part of his neck. And she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father! And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Hmm. Then Esau said to Jacob, Please come near me that I may feel you, my son, 
whether you are really Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are Esau's. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near me and I will eat of my son's game so my soul may bless you. And so he brought it near him and he ate. And he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and he blessed him. And he said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and the plenty of the grain of the wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren. Let your mother's son bow down to you. Now, let me just stop right there. As you're reading this story, you're hearing the story of Isaac blessing his sons, or he's going to bless his son Esau. And you hear this tricky story of this conflict going on between Isaac and Jacob. Twins. But you can't miss the favoritism that's taking place in the family. Esau is favored by his father. Jacob is favored by his mother. If you go back to chapter 25, turn your Bibles so you can see this. You can underline it. You can mark it. Look at verse 26. After his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, Isaac was 60 years old when, when she bore them. And the boys grew. This is what the Bible tells us about the boys. Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Esau grew up to be a man, what we would call a man's man. He was a hunter. He was a farmer. He was the guy that could go out and take a piece of, piece of wood and whittle it and make a little object, and you'd be like, wow, that is awesome. He was the kind of kid that grew up, and he would hunt and trap and fish, and, and he was the type of kid that Isaac was proud of. He looked at Esau and said, Esau, you are a strong young man. I am proud of you, son. Everything that you do, I like. I have the same hobbies, the same interests, that you have, I like that. We get along well together. We can talk about things together. We can enjoy things together. Remember that time you caught this fish that was this big? Yeah. You are skilled. I enjoy spending time with you. Now let me tell you about the other son. They're, they're twins. That's what's so incredible about this. They're twins. Are they identical? No, they're not. Esau, by the way, is hairy. He's a little bear that comes out. He's just, the Bible tells us he's hairy all over. But Jacob. But Jacob, verse 27, was a mild man. Meaning, and he dwelt in tents. Mild means literally one who takes to the heel. Jacob followed after his mother. He was in the tent all day. He spent time with his mom. We would call him a mommy's boy. Wherever Rebecca was at, there Jacob was. Can, son, can you help me with this? Yes, mom, I'll be right there. His arms were smooth. When he was 21 thinking, son, do you have a mustache yet? Nope. Esau already had a mustache at 16. Esau at 16 was probably growing a beard. And poor Jacob was going, I got one hair. Be careful that the goats don't lick it off. And Jacob's like, am I a man? Well, you're more like your mom. She's pretty. She's smooth-skinned. She's good-looking. Why don't you go back in the tent? So Isaac really doesn't have anything in common with Jacob. Can you imagine what it would be like for Jacob and Isaac's relationship? 
who is the favorite of Isaac? Parents, it is difficult and it's important for you not to show favoritism. And if you're showing favoritism to a kid, you've got to figure out a way to stop. It is clear from Scripture that Isaac, when it, my son Esau, and let's talk about Rebekah, Jacob is her son. They're twins. It was the only kids that they had. But the way they chose to raise them all the way up to the end, they were a divided family. Favoritism is not an act of love. It's a flaw in our character. Favoritism divides families, divides people. It doesn't unite them. It creates trust issues. I don't know how many times Jacob probably went to his father. I'm just speculating to try to build and establish some sort of relationship, and it just wasn't there. Or how many times maybe Esau tried to work in some sort of relationship with his mom, and it just wasn't there. It went both ways. It wasn't just dad, it was mom too. Because now mom is trying to... Mom is trying to fool her husband to make sure her son, the son that she loves more than she loves the other son, that he receives an inheritance. And what's silly and sad about this is that neither parent was willing to listen and follow and obey God's word. From the very beginning, before the birth even took place, we were, were already told, they were already told, that the younger child would be the one who would receive the inheritance. And yet, even in the blessing of Isaac, Isaac is saying, oh yeah, and you're in his blessing. And may your mother's sons bow down to you. Huh. That didn't really go that way. Esau is going to bow down to Jacob. And through this division, Rebekah loses her son, Jacob. Esau is so furious when he comes back, he's ready to kill Jacob. Jacob has to leave and go somewhere else to find a wife. You see, favoritism doesn't unite, it doesn't do anybody any favors, it just creates division. That's why even in the church, we cannot have favoritism it just destroys. We have to look out for personal favoritism because it happens even in our day and age that we're, we're involved in. There's cultural bias that we face. I want you to go to James, James chapter 2. We'll spend the rest of our time in James. Because remember, James is the brother of Christ. James is the one who, when he finally believes that Jesus is the risen Savior, he is on board 100%. Before he was a denier of Christ as the Messiah, now that he finally believes, he is recognizing, hey, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, get on board and follow him 100%. Don't be partial. Don't be halfway there. Follow him or don't follow him. Make a decision. You can't be a really, really good person. You can't be a really, really good Jew and not follow Christ. Your morals aren't good enough. In chapter 2, he says, My brethren, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality, with favoritism. So in other words, here's the illustration that he lays out. If there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, you sit in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit at my footstool, have you not shown partiality or favoritism among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In James's time period, 
This is a cultural bias that they had. And you know, it's interesting that we have the same thing today, don't we? We look at people who have money or who have wealth, and we think we want to treat them nicer than people who maybe come in in dirty rags. Why do we do that? We think that the person who has money, they might do something for us, where the poor person doesn't have the means to do something for us. That's a cultural bias. Like if Bill Gates comes in, he may build a new church for us. Where the poor person comes in, they don't have the funds to build a new church. They have no means to do that. And James is right. Why do we look at that? Why do we treat people with favoritism? That is contrary to loving one another. That is contrary to loving others. That is completely contrary to the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to explain. Listen, my beloved brethren, God has, has, has He not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and, and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name which you are called? James is just laying out, said, here's the truth in practice. The rich don't do anything good for you. The reality is they are hurting you. And that doesn't mean a rich person can't go to heaven. He's just laying out, here's just the way life is back then. This is a cultural bias that they're facing. And we face some of the same things today. We look at people who dress nice and we think, oh, they must be friendlier. They must be nicer. But that's not true. We have to know our biases. There are some things each of us have that hinder us. It might be social. It might be class. It might be financial. It might be gender. It might be faith. It might be racist. There's a variety of things that can be, but these are things that are contrary to faith. You cannot judge a person based on those things. And say, you know, you're not a good person because, well, you're not one of me. You're not like me. That's arrogance and pride. The love of Christ caused Christ to leave His heavenly throne to come be among us, to take on the form of a slave, to walk among us to save sinners who had no desire to be saved, who had no desire to go to heaven, who loved wallowing in our sin and yet he saved us he didn't care whether we were rich or poor he didn't care what nationality we were he didn't care what religion we were from but being drawn up on the cross he drew all, drew all people to himself if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again you'll be saved He breaks down the barriers. He breaks down the walls. It doesn't matter if you're female or if you're male. And each of us have these biases. Now I mentioned to you I grew up in New England, up in Maine. And see, so we had people on this visible barrier, this visible border called uh, Canada. The only thing that kept us separated from Canada would be birch trees and maybe some water. And you could just walk across the border. This is how it is and from Maine to Canada. There's nothing up there. Lots of woods. But you would think that as people who all look the same and for the most part sound the same, there would be no prejudice. There would be no bias. But there is. They even have a shared cultural. But because people are different, biases come up. 
And one of the ways that you could tell people who were from northern Maine from those who are from New Brunswick was the way they talked. People from Canada, Canada would say things like, you dare, 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 you dare me. It wasn't hard to figure out when they're at a store where they were Canadian French. Or they would say, there, you dare, you come over there, dare you me. Uh-huh. They drove the same kind of car. Everything was the same. Why was there a bias? Interesting how we have things that we grew up with, a part of our culture. But there's no room for that in Christianity. Because love is supposed to push those things out. How do we overcome favoritism? How do we get rid of these things? James says this. Whoever keeps... Or verse 8 says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture... You shall love your neighbor as yourselves. We overcome favoritism by loving others as we love ourselves. The royal law, the spiritual law, the law in which we are not showing partiality, we're concerned about following Christ. And once we look at the one another commands and we say, these commands are for me. I'm going to be intentional today and I'm going to keep them towards the people that are in the room with me in this small body in this church. So as it states as I read this that I'm not to show partiality, I'm not to show favoritism, I'm going to exercise love. I'm going to do that with the people that are just in this room to start with and practice. And it's going to flow over into my family. It's going to flow over into the people that I work with. That they're going to recognize and see that I'm going to be fulfilling the law, the, the whole law, because I'm going to be loving them as I love myself. That doesn't happen by one act. It doesn't happen by me doing it twice. It takes time for people to recognize and see a change in us. Some of the one another things, you can tell there's a change by confessing your sins. Some, if you walk up to someone, I'm going to confess my sins to them. Well, okay, that's, that's a little different and out of the norm. But not showing favoritism. That's a lifestyle change. That's a change that we've got to guard ourselves day in and day out. And when we're, we have to replace that with something else. And we'll replace it with the faith of following Christ. And I challenge you with just the simple thing of loving one another as Christ has loved you. And in doing so, People will recognize that you are his disciples. So this week, as you are interacting with your mother and your father, your spouse, your children, maybe co-workers, will they see the love of Christ in you? Maybe you have someone that you're discipling. You can even ask them, and state, my goal is that you see the love of Christ in me. Will you monitor that and, and, and check and see if I'm behaving that way? In the way that I'm talking, the way that I'm acting? That I'm placing others first instead of myself? Because that's one of my goals that I want people to see in my life.
Can you do that? I think you can. Let's pray. And Father, Lord, we thank you for our time together. And as we look at where not to show favoritism, it is easy just to hear a message and hear words. But as we walk out the door and we start putting it into practice, old habits die hard. We get into the rut of everyday life. And the words that we heard this morning grow distantly faint. So we're relying on your Holy Spirit to re help us to recall these truths. Help us to be men and women of integrity. We'll refine this in place us into our everyday life and help us to be uh, called to account when we step out of line. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I